Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is one that is truly a dark tangled web. It involves the death of a woman who was known to be this kind, caring woman who worked in a field where only the strongest and most empathetic people can work. But as they investigate more into her death, they find out so much more than they expected. And the suspect in this case is literally the last person that you would think of. It's such a crazy case with a lot of twists and turns, so strap in, it's going to be a wild one. With that, let's just get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the murder of Christina Parcell. 41-year-old Christina Parcell worked as a veterinary technician at Foothills Veterinary Hospital in Greenville, South Carolina. Those who worked with her described that she had a larger-than-life personality. One coworker described her as one of the most epic vet techs to the dogs that the clinic saw. They said that she was always trying to make those around her feel at ease. She was even-tempered and always did a good job of showing genuine compassion and empathy. They said that the dog she cared for loved her because she did such an incredible job with them. She was someone who could make you smile even in the worst of situations and would leave you laughing so hard that your stomach hurt. Christina was the mother to a young daughter who she shared with a man named John Mello. By all accounts, Christina loved her daughter. Her daughter was her entire world. She had great things going for her at this time. She wasn't with the father of her child anymore, but she did have a fiancé, a man named Bradley Post. She was close with her sister, who was living right there in town, and I believe they were actually living in the same house together at one point. She was living the best life that she possibly could, surrounded by people who loved her. But despite having a lot of great things going for her, she was in the middle of a contentious custody battle with John over their daughter. John Mello worked as a music producer who had previously lived in the West Coast before moving to Greenville, South Carolina with his family. It's unclear how the pair met or how long they had been dating before having their daughter, but the custody battles for her started in 2016. By October 5th, 2020, John had actually taken their young daughter and flew with her to Italy right in the middle of their custody battles. So, of course, she filed for charges against him for custodial interference. However, by October 13th, 2021, Bradley Post, Christina's fiance, hadn't been able to get a hold of her that entire morning, so he began to panic. He called her multiple times that morning, all of which went unanswered. So, he went to the home where Christina lived with her sister, and when he walked in the door, he found a horrific scene. He found that Christina had been brutally attacked, and she was unresponsive on the living room floor. Immediately, Bradley called 911 to report the scene. When police arrived, they found that Christina had been brutally attacked. Turns out, she had actually been stabbed over 30 times to her head and neck area in her home. We don't know all of the details for how the scene was, but what's been released is that the scene was just chaotic. They said that there are apparently some ritualistic components to it. They said that her body had been dragged to the front living room of the home after she was murdered because there were drag marks everywhere and that she was posed in a certain way to be found. Then the killer sprinkled rose petals all around her body and all around the living room. There was clear evidence that this crime scene had been staged. This is why so many media outlets are calling Christina's case the Rose Petal murder. At the scene, police found that it appeared to have no sign of forced entry into the home, but Bradley told investigators that they usually kept the back door unlocked, so that is how he entered the home, so it's possible that the offender also entered through that way. In the home, they found memory cards and a laptop in the living room by her body, as well as a clear Ziploc bag that had a white powder substance inside, which they later confirmed to be cocaine, located on the living room table. On that bag, there appeared to be little spots of dried blood. They found that her cell phone was located near her body as well. Then they found her purse sitting on a table in the hallway right by the living room. In that purse, there were two white envelopes, each with $500 cash inside. In the back room of the home, they found a small single-shot firearm located inside of a bag, which was located inside of a suitcase. So the gun was put in a bag, and then the bag with the gun in it was placed in a suitcase. In Christina's bedroom, there were multiple documents regarding an ongoing court battle over her daughter. 
By those papers, there were multiple other USB drives. Her sheets appeared to have bloodstains on them and spray tests done throughout the home also showed possible presence of blood all throughout the home. So this shows that Christina had been through a very, very violent attack. So of course, police did a search of Christina's cell phone to see if there was anything on her phone that could lead them to her killer. Then, as we know, her fiance is the one who found her, and it's just significantly likely that the significant other of the victim, in any case, is the one who's responsible. So, police went ahead and took his cell phone into evidence as well. Responding officers initially said that when they arrived to the scene and started asking Bradley questions, he was shaking and appeared upset, but he was not as upset as you would expect from somebody who just found his fiance dead. He was also acting very nervous and was having trouble answering some of the very basic questions that they were asking him. He also wore gloves while he was showing investigators around the home, which investigators did find very strange. In the meantime, as I stated before, her ex, John, had taken their daughter to Italy. At this time, he had not returned her to the country yet, despite the order given. So he could have technically been involved, but it didn't seem very likely at that time due to the fact that he wasn't even in the country. However, throughout the course of the investigation, there were a lot of things uncovered that just makes this case a very dark, tangled web. They found some very, very disturbing things about Christina and Bradley, her fiance. As I stated before, Bradley was acting very strange during the initial encounter with police, but it wasn't necessarily because he killed her. It turned out that Christina and Bradley were involved in two civil lawsuits. One lawsuit was brought on behalf of Christina's young daughter, and the other was on behalf of another minor female, and they were based on evidence that police found during the investigation into Christina's murder. We don't know the names or identities of either minor female due to their ages and what is being alleged. Both lawsuits claim that Christina and Bradley participated in the sexual exploitation of these two minors. The dates of the lawsuits are after the murder, which is a little bit confusing, but again, the evidence found was during the investigation for Christina's murder, so this was taking place before she was murdered. The first lawsuit was filed in February of 2022, and this lawsuit states that Christina and Bradley took photos and videos of and with the minor female in states of being undressed and in sexually provocative positions. The second lawsuit was filed in August of 2022, and this one states that Christina's daughter was photographed in various stages of undress and in sexually explicit and nude positions. Many of these photos expose her private parts like her breasts and genitals. Both lawsuits claim that Christina was well aware of Bradley's involvement in the alleged sexual abuse, and it also says that Christina had participated in this as well. I saw in one source that these photos and videos were discovered on Bradley's phone, then he transferred the materials to his computer and then saved them in different files on the computer and then transferred those into different storage devices. I also saw in other sources that Christina was in the photos either with her daughter or the minor or both. So again, it didn't just seem like Christina was letting Bradley do these things to her daughter and the other young girl. She was participating and she was even in some of the photos. Then as they dug deeper into their personal lives, there was even more disturbing things that they found. I don't know the exact details of these charges either because the articles that I read about this will not disclose their sources, but based on the charges that we see, it seems to be very likely. These articles state that investigators also found videos of Christina and Bradley both individually and together, engaging in sexual acts with animals. Reports say that there are multiple dogs in particular who have been victimized by both of them. Apparently, with Christina's job, she not only took care of the dogs as a vet tech, but she also frequently brought them home to foster them for short periods. And allegedly, that is when these acts would happen. 
According to court documents, Bradley is charged with buggery, which is defined as any sort of sexual activity between animals and humans. The law states, whoever shall commit the abominable crime of buggery, whether with mankind or with beast, shall on conviction be guilty of felony and shall be imprisoned in the penitentiary for five years or shall pay a fine of not less than $500 or both at the discretion of the court. I don't know if these charges have stuck, but I do know that he has not yet gone to trial on any of the things that he's been accused of. I did see official court documents with these charges listed, but again, I don't know if the buggery one specifically has stuck because I haven't seen any further documentation on that other than that charge being mentioned. So clearly, and not to put this lightly, they are both alleged monsters. I almost feel, I feel very conflicted. Like, I feel like I can't go too hard in on Christina, and I don't know if that's because these materials were found with Bradley and he seems to be mostly responsible, or if it is because Christina isn't here to defend herself. But at the same time, I know that she is gone, but if she is involved with this, I can't say I feel too sorry for these things coming out about her and her not being able to defend herself. I don't know. It's such a strange, conflicting feeling when someone is killed and so many people loved them, yet they turned out to have done some really awful, unforgivable things in their lives, but they're not here to explain or defend themselves. Again, I don't want to seem like I'm going too soft on Christina because, again, she isn't here to defend herself or explain, but if Bradley does go to trial and she is found to have like concrete proof that she was involved in hurting her own child and this minor and these dogs, I can't say that I feel bad for her. And I can say with confidence that she was truly, truly a monster. But until then, I do just want to give her a little bit of grace until it's confirmed that she was involved in these things. Either way, after finding these disturbing images and videos, Bradley Post was arrested on October 19th, 2021 on seven counts of sexual exploitation of a minor, one count of sexual misconduct with a minor, and one count of buggery. But despite finding this disturbing evidence and being arrested, police did not think that Bradley had anything to do with Christina's murder. They, again, think that he was acting so nervous and suspiciously because the walls were closing in and they were going to find out about his disgusting fetishes. Like I said, John Mallow had left the country with their daughter on October 5th, 2020. Well, he returned back to the country by October 21st, 2021, just two days after Christina's murder. Upon his return, he was served with a custodial interference warrant and he was placed into custody. Once in custody, there was a spot where you could name someone on the relationship portion of the booking paperwork. On that portion, he named a then 29-year-old man named Zachary Hughes. That was the only person that John put down as someone that he had a close relationship with. Him putting Zach down meant that he was allowed to pretty much only communicate with this man while he was incarcerated. He also named Zach as having exclusive rights to obtain his luggage and medication from the airport since he was arrested before he was able to collect these items. At the time, it seemed like Zach was just a random man and they really had no idea what connection he had with John. But after looking further into his background, they did figure out the connection. Now I'm going to talk more about Zach Hughes and his background. Zach was born and raised in Morro Bay, California to his parents, Dave and Mindy Hughes. He had one biological brother named Eli and the family stayed in California for quite some time. However, by 2005, David and Mindy took the family and their lives in a whole new direction. They moved the family across the country to Virginia and once there, they decided to adopt five additional children into the family. These five children were all siblings from Russia and their goal was to instill morals in Zach and Eli as well as give these five children a safe, loving, and stable home. But once they got there, as you can expect with children who are uprooted from their country and moved in with a new family after most likely suffering some sort of maltreatment from their biological family, 
these children all had significant emotional, psychological, and physical problems that the family wasn't totally prepared for. The children had a lot of trouble adjusting to their new lives, and Zach and Eli also had a lot of trouble adjusting to their new lives with these five new siblings. The family first lived on a farm in Virginia, and they worked on their own farm to provide for the family, but this wasn't enough. Zach, the oldest, had to step in and sort of take on a caregiver role in order to help take care of his new siblings. Obviously, this caused a lot of stress for Zach. So in order to deal with his life at home, Zach took to music as an outlet. His parents bought him a piano when he was little, and he quickly took to it. He basically played that piano whenever he could, and he was really good. By high school, Zach started participating in competitions, and he won first place at the Southeastern Piano Festival. Because of that, he got to perform solo with the South Carolina Philharmonic Orchestra. By 2010, he applied for the Juilliard School for Piano Performance, a highly competitive performing arts school in New York City, and not only was he accepted, but he was offered multiple scholarships. While there, he did very well. He made tons of friends and exceeded in his schooling. He was the only student from the U.S. chosen to play in the Kyoto International Music Festival, along with 11 other students chosen throughout the world. He was described by those around him as a loyal friend, a great listener with strong morals and a big heart for defending those who needed help. He spent his spare time using his musical talents to play at hospitals and nursing homes and rehab facilities, brightening the days of everybody who got to listen. By 2018, he attended the University of Tennessee to earn his master's degree in piano performance. While there, his strong morals for wanting to provide not only for his family but his country led him to volunteering for the U.S. Marine Corps. He applied for the Officer Candidate School, which is a competitive program which allows you to train for the Marine Corps for less than a year. They focused on military skills and leadership. But two weeks into the training, unfortunately, he suffered stress fractures to both of his legs, which caused him to have to withdraw. Then he decided to pause his academics as well. This was because he was contacted by a woman who was looking for a talented pianist to play at the christening of a church in Greenville, South Carolina. And he accepted moving from Tennessee to South Carolina and he decided to stay there and he would perform at the church. Him and the church came to an agreement that all the donations they received from those attending the performances would be split 50-50 between him and the church. By early 2020, when COVID hit and large gatherings were limited, Zach had to turn to other means to make a living. He got an electric keyboard and started performing in large open public spaces. He also provided virtual piano lessons during this time as well. So we can see that Zach is a talented young man who came from relatively humble beginnings. He seemed to have a good family life. Even though there was a lot of stress, he found appropriate outlets for that stress. He had a love for giving back and helping others, and he just overall seemed like an amazing person. At this point, you might be asking how this kind of man could get mixed up in a situation like this one. Well, at some point while living in Greenville, Zach met John Mello, who again, I said earlier, worked as a music producer. We don't know exactly how they met, but it seems like they were both in the music scene, so it seems like this is probably what drew them to one another. Between the years of 2020 and 2021, Zach started to work for John, cleaning his house for him, and doing other general domestic duties. But until John returned back from Italy with his daughter, it didn't totally seem like they had such a close bond to the point that John would put Zach as the only person he wanted contact with while behind bars. But as the investigation into Christina's death continued, they found more evidence of the relationship that Zach and John had, as well as things that connect Zach to Christina's death death. So first, investigators found a ring doorbell camera located across the street from Christina's home. On that footage, they saw an individual wearing a gray hoodie and carrying a black backpack enter Christina's home at 10 a.m. the day before her body was discovered. A few hours later, this video captured the same man leaving Christina's house, riding a bicycle, and concealing their identity with an N95 mask and wearing the hoodie over his head. This led police to examining other cameras around the area as well. 
The cameras that they looked into are called flock cameras, and these are license plate reading cameras that store the data from every vehicle that it captures. It showed that on the day before Christina's murder, as well as on the day of Christina's murder, the flock camera captured Zach's truck driving by with a bicycle located in the bed of the truck. This bicycle was the same one that was seen being ridden by the man who left Christina's home on the day of the murder around the time that it was thought that she was murdered. Using this, police executed a search warrant on the home where Zach lived. And they did end up finding a bicycle matching the bicycle I just mentioned in the home. During the execution of the search warrant, police also confiscated Zach's phone. There was a passcode on the phone and police weren't able to get into the phone, but they were able to download some data from it. They were able to download the WhatsApp conversations between him and John Mello, geolocations from Google, text messages, phones, emails, and data that shows when the phone was turned off and on, and when it was placed into airplane mode. Now, there were about 1,769 text messages sent between John and Zach on WhatsApp, but a lot of these messages were scrambled, so that means that the words and the sentences are mixed up and the messages themselves are out of order. So I will talk about what messages we do see that appear to be significant to the investigation. I will post pictures of the text messages if I can, but again, they are scrambled up, so what I say, which is the proper English, will look different from what the text itself says. On April 17th, 2021, six months before Christina's death, John tells Zach that he got Christina's personal phone number, he gave it to Zach, and he asked Zach to harass the shit out of her. After that, there were multiple other conversations from there. A lot of the conversations outline how close of a relationship the two shared, but I haven't seen too much information beyond that. But they also did find significant communication between October 8th through the 13th. On the 13th, the day of the murder, John asked Zach, in what appears to be a cryptic message, how did the music research go? And Zach replied, good, I'll tell you over the phone. So it doesn't appear that they were actually talking about music research, that they were talking about something else in a cryptic way so that, you know, Zach could tell John that he wanted to tell him over the phone without saying like, hey, let's talk about the murder over the phone because I don't want to text about it. That was what is assumed from these text messages. Because they didn't have the passcode, they couldn't find the exact dates and times for the location data on the phone. So even if the phone did show that it was by Christina's home at some point, they couldn't say when he was by the home, so that wasn't going to be really helpful for the investigation but they were able to see that the phone was placed on airplane mode two different times on October 13th, the day of the murder, which again, can say that he wanted to conceal where he was on that day. Based on the evidence that they found at this point, a warrant was put out for Zach's arrest. Now, at the time that police were working to file charges, Zach had been hired to perform on an international cruise line, so he was headed to Europe for that job. So, by the time the charges were announced, Zach had already been in Michigan. It would have been very easy for Zach to have just left the country at that point, either by crossing the border into Canada, since he was pretty close, or he could have just boarded his flight to Europe and hopped on a cruise ship that was going to be sailing for who knows how long. If he left, it would have been a hell of a lot easier for him to run and stay hidden and a hell of a lot harder for investigators to find him. But as soon as he found out about the charges, he went back to South Carolina and surrendered on November 3rd, 2021. He told his lawyers that he wanted to be in the country to stand trial and to prove his innocence. But since being in jail, he would not provide investigators with the passcode to his phone. Since this, police have filed multiple petitions for the courts to rule that Zach must provide his passcode, and the judge did actually grant this order, but from what I have seen, Zach continued to refuse to give his passcode. There were multiple times that he gave different passcodes to try, but all of them turned out to be wrong. The prosecution says that this was done in an attempt to mislead investigators. But by February 8th of 2023, investigators said that after almost 700,000 attempts, they finally got that phone unlocked. They said that unlocking the phone will lead them to finding a much clearer picture of what happened and what Zach's possible connection is to all of this. 
But as of right now, they have not yet released what new information they have found on Zach's phone. In addition to this digital evidence that they have gathered, prosecutors in the case have also stated that Zach's DNA was found under Christina's fingernails, which says to them that Zach was the one who viciously attacked Christina. Prosecutors allege that this crime was the result of considerable amount of calculation and planning. During the various court hearings since Zach has been held in jail, the prosecution discussed all of the evidence that brought them to the point of arrest. The ring doorbell footage, the WhatsApp messages, the DNA, and the obvious attempts at misleading investigators when it came to getting his phone's passcode. However, Zach's defense attorneys argued that the video footage doesn't actually show Zach, so there's no way to tell if it truly is him. They talked about how he had no prior arrests or convictions and absolutely no history of violence. He even left the state and came all the way back just to turn himself in. The defense argues that he has absolutely no motive to commit the murder and he hardly has any connection with John, Christina, or Bradley. They said that his actions are those of an innocent man and that he did not kill Christina. They talked about how at the initial scene, Bradley was the one who was acting nervous and suspicious. He is the one with a motive and a connection to the victim. Zach maintains his innocence to this day. The, the facts that, that show the, uh, so Zach Hughes tied to this case and the basis of the arrest warrant um, show that about 10 o'clock um, that morning, a ring camera from across the street shows the defendant dressed in a black hoodie and a backpack entering the front door. Uh, the defendant is seen on camera from another ring camera leaving the subdivision on a bicycle. By way of background, Christina Parcell has a daughter who is around the age of nine, and she was engaged in an extremely contentious custody battle with the father of the child. The father of the child and Zach Hughes are very close friends, and Your Honor, we have, um, and I'll go into it a little bit, we have emails and texts showing their close relationship as well as when the father of the child was arrested for custodial interference for leaving with the child to Italy. When he was arrested on his jail screen, he put, the only family member that he put on the jail screen was Zach Hughes. So the, the relationship is very, very close. I wanna make sure that your honor knows that Zach, uh, and we, we said this in our memorandum, based on the discovery that's been produced, there's no evidence that we're aware of that establishes a connection between Zach and the victim in this case. Um, just a little bit about um, Zach Hughes, the person that Mr. Moran and I have gotten to know these past months, and the person for whom all of these people are here in this courtroom today. Um, first thing that I think that becomes apparent about Zach in getting to know him is that he is just remarkably gifted, um, both musically and intellectually. He's highly and widely educated. Um, I want to point out that he has a history of giving up himself to the community um, and bringing joy and happiness to others through his art, through his music. Um, I would point out that he also um, gave of himself to his country. And I'll get into that in just a moment. But probably what stands out to me most glaringly is how widely admired, respected, and loved he is. Um, the outpouring of support has been like nothing I've seen. Uh, we've just been inundated with calls and emails and um, letters from the very beginning of our representation from professors and former classmates at the Juilliard school, school where he got his undergraduate degree, from his prior piano teachers, from parents of children that he taught piano lessons to, from lawyers and other professionals, from former employers and co-workers, from classical musicians uh, across this country and actually from other countries and just from ordinary people who have been touched by his performances and who got to know him that way. Your Honor, Zach's background and his past actions demonstrate that he's not a danger flight. Mr. Mormon touched on this, and um, I will just touch briefly on, on it as well. But um, first off, Zach has no prior history of the criminal justice system. He has no convictions, he's never been charged, he has no pending charges. In fact, the opposite is actually true. Zach actually returned to his, this jurisdiction to face charges. Zach was in Detroit, Michigan, 
uh, when he got word of the warrants that were pending, he had been uh, uh, seeking employment um, through uh, where he was going to be playing uh, with chamber music groups for a, a cruise line. And in preparation for that, he had tickets to go to Europe. He was in. He was ready to board a plane the next day. From his location, he literally could have walked with his passport in his pocket across the bridge and been in Canada. But when he got word, he didn't have to be convinced to come back. He came back. He walked into a car deal, uh, a rental car establishment. He rented a car. He drove through the night. He came back and he turned himself in. Since Zach's arrest, the courts have received upwards of 52 letters from various people who all knew Zach all to support him and talk about just how great of a person he is. I read a bunch of these letters and so many people from his classmates to teachers and friends and family all came out in droves to show their support for Zach. They talked about his extensive history of volunteering, working hard, and helping others. They talked about how amazing he was to be around and to watch perform. They talked about how intelligent and kind he was, and anybody who knew him was lucky to have him as such an amazing person in their life. They argued that Zach was not a flight risk, nor is he any danger to himself or others. So many people believe that he not only should be granted bond to await trial at home, but nobody thinks that he could have done anything like this. At his bail hearing, he asked to be given a $100,000 bond, he asked that he be on house arrest with his parents, and he agreed to have no contact with the family of the victim. But he was denied bond, and he is now awaiting trial in jail. So Mr. Hughes can hear it. I'm going to deny bond based on everything I've heard today. I will allow the defense to revisit that should their DNA expert produce conclusive evidence that, that might contradict some of the state's evidence and should the phone records become of importance and relevance in uh, determining that he was not involved in this offense. So at this point, that is all of the information that we know. As of right now, Zach is awaiting his trial behind bars. His trial is currently set to take place sometime in 2024. Again, Zach maintains his innocence and continues to say that he had no connection to Christina and no motive. October 13th, I was in Italy. I can't help their perception. I, I can only pray and move forward for, for my child. I, I, can't, I can't cater to people. I can't respond to people. You know, I can't do anything but focus all my efforts on the well-being of my child. We went there to, con to, to finalize our, our citizenship, and I wanted her to be away from these people, and I wanted her to have a better life. And free education, free university anywhere in Europe, you know, health care for me and everything. And, I'm, you know, that was my retirement plan. I want to see justice for his victims. I want sunlight shining on every player in this that did these children wrong. Until I'm in the ground or my daughter's old enough to make her own decision, I will fight for her. It's just that simple. There, there's, there's no alternative. But given the information that we have, I think if Zach truly is guilty, I think we can all see why. This is all totally just my opinion and pure speculation, but I think that the reason John took their daughter away from the country is because he may have found out about the disturbing things that his ex and her new fiance are accused of doing at some point. We don't know much about John or his personality or his background, but let's assume for a moment that he isn't just a narcissistic abuser who wants to take their daughter away from his ex to make her suffer. I think most people who go to that great of lengths to get their child out of the situation that they're in with the other parent are doing so because they feel that the child is in danger for one reason or another, whether it's justified or not. So I think that John may have found out about what they were allegedly doing and he wanted to get his daughter as far away from them as possible. But then after that, it could have gone a number of different ways. 
Maybe John told his friend Zach about the allegations and Zach was very disturbed. As we know, throughout his life, Zach has felt this innate need to do what's right. He wanted to do whatever it was his moral compass said was right. And maybe he felt so disturbed by this that he and John came up with the plan to take her out of the picture and make her pay for what she was allegedly doing. The amount of stab wounds, the overkill, the posing of the scene, the rose petals, all of those things point to someone who wanted to make a point, who wanted people around the victim to know that what this person has done is awful and that is why they are dead. Or maybe after finding out, John started to manipulate Zach. Maybe John had a plan all along to take advantage of a younger guy who he knew just wanted to do the right thing. Maybe after months of talking about it and convincing, John convinced Zach to kill Christina in order to protect his child. Because I do think that protecting their daughter and the other child and the animals would have been the reason why Zach would think that killing Christina was a moral thing to do. Again, even if it wasn't Zach's idea to begin with, he could have still been so angry and upset at what Christina was accused of doing that he took it out fully when he stabbed her those 31 times. Either way, no matter how the situation happened, I think that both John and Zach knew about what Christina and Bradley were allegedly doing and I think they wanted to do something about it. I don't think it's a coincidence that John returned to the country just a few days after the murders. I think that if they did formulate this plan for Zach to do it, I think they thought of it as, you know, of course, John would be looked at first, but he knew that he was out of the country, so there's no way he could have done it. And because him and Zach didn't have this tight connection that a lot of people on the outside knew about, I think John thought, well, Zach is the perfect person to do it because there's no way that they're going to connect Zach back to me and there's no way that they're gonna find Zach to begin with. But then we have the whole other possibility that the police have it all wrong, that maybe Bradley was actually the one who murdered his fiance. Maybe Christina no longer wanted to be a part of the disgusting acts and she threatened to tell someone if they continued, and maybe Bradley killed her because of that. He might have killed her in a fit of rage, and after he killed her, maybe he regretted it, and maybe that's why he put those rose petals all over the place. I can't explain the DNA under the fingernails or the bike that matches the video, other than to say that maybe the bike was just a popular type of bike in that area, and that Bradley had ridden one that was so close to the one that Zach had that it was just a coincidence that it looked just like Zach's. And I guess with the DNA, the defense can probably find some arguments for why the DNA isn't valid. They do that a lot. They could probably say the testing was wrong or it was touch DNA or it was transfer DNA or something like that that could maybe say that Zach wasn't the one responsible, but I don't know all of the details of the evidence that they found. But when it comes to either of these men being involved, it doesn't make complete sense. With Bradley, he has to know that a murder investigation is going to lead investigators to going through his stuff and finding everything out. He had to have known that, and the fact that he didn't destroy all of the evidence before police got to it says to me that he probably didn't kill Christina because, again, she was killed about, I think, 30 hours before she was reported to the police. So that's a long time for Bradley to have destroyed a bunch of evidence. So I don't think that he necessarily is the one responsible for killing Christina because I do think that he would have gotten rid of any evidence that points to his involvement with this child abuse and animal abuse. I do think that after she was murdered, he probably was nervous because he knew about all of the stuff that he had been doing and he probably knew he was going to have his stuff searched and he probably knew he'd be caught even if he wasn't the one that killed her himself. And when it comes to Zach, I think it makes even less sense. Someone with such a bright future, with so much talent and such a strong moral compass, it just doesn't make any sense. I know that if I had someone I knew that was doing the things that Bradley and Christina are accused of doing, I would want to do something too. But even if it was my best friend or very close friend or significant other or anybody else very close to me who I found out was doing these nasty things, I don't think I could go to those lengths. I would want to, anybody would want to, but in the end, I would want them to have to go in front of a judge and face the consequences for what they did. And even if you did go to those lengths, 
it's because it's someone that you personally know. So then throw in the fact that now, instead of someone close to you, it's a friend of a friend, someone you don't know. I get that you still see your friend upset and I would be very upset even if I didn't know the person. I'm very upset that these people did this and I don't even know them at all. But you still see them suffering from what that person did and you still know that children and animals are suffering. But I don't see how someone from such a normal background with no history of violence and in fact, they're such a great person and they do so many great things just jumps to this level of violence and does this. It's not like he just went in there and poisoned her or shot her one time and left. 31 stabbings is a very long time and then to drag the body and pose it, that is violent. That's very violent. That's a brutal attack. And someone with such a clean and good history doesn't just jump to that in most cases, but it seems that in this case, that's exactly what happened. Because in a lot of these cases, you say like, oh, it's out of their character. They would never do something like this. But then they're just like a normal person who does normal things. Sometimes they get really upset over things and sometimes they can't control their emotions. And there are little things that you can see that's like, okay, maybe I could see them doing this. But Zach is the type of person who genuinely gave his everything to everybody else and he did whatever he could to help others and it just doesn't seem in his character to do something like this. But at the same time, I could also see that somebody with such strong morals, somebody who believes in their cause so strongly that they genuinely believe that these people deserve this. I know I say in every case that I want to hear what you all think, but for this case especially, I'm so curious. I want to hear what all of you have to say about all of this. I want all of us to have a discussion about this and tell me what you think about this case because this is a truly wild case. Even with everything that I said, it is my opinion that I do think Zach is guilty. I do think he did this and I'm just curious to see how the trial is going to go. But that is all of the information that I have for today's video. As I stated, we are still awaiting trial. We won't know what's on the phone or any of the other details about the investigation until next year when the trial is supposed to take place. Right now, it's set to be in 2024. I definitely think that this is going to be a tough case to prosecute, especially with how much support Zach has. I wonder if the texts are going to make that job easier, but I'm so curious to see what other information they have. But yeah, that's where I'm going to end today's video, and now is the time to sound off in the comments. Do you think that Zach is guilty? If so, why do you think he did this? Or do you think that Bradley was involved? What do you think of these disturbing allegations of abuse against the children and animals? Do you think Christina and Bradley are guilty of this? Let me know any and all thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and check out my Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. All of those will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form that is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!